All right, everybody. It's been a while since we've had any lesson uh, later in the day. And I mentioned last week I was going to bring some things and I simply call this show and tell. So that's what this is going to be called, show and tell. Uh, we may have to have a second, third installs, install, um, installments in the future. But let me run through some things that I've had. Some of these I've shown some of you before. Um, we'll start with these two things. Oral Roberts. Most everybody knew his name as a world-famous faith healing evangelist. And um, he put out the story that he and a friend were having a dinner together, eating together, and his friend had medical problems and he needed some prayer, medical help. And so Oral Roberts traced the outline of his hands on the paper napkin at the restaurant um, wrote a little encourage, encouraging note, and then he left just enough space on the lower half of the napkin so that when the guy put this napkin over his sore area and prayed and got his miracle, then he could write a little note thanking um, Reverend Roberts for, for his uh, kindness. And um, I don't know if this was done by the ministry, but it probably was. A couple of little spots on it that even looked like food stains. But they had these napkins mass produced like this with his hand tracing on there. And uh, I suppose if you're watching him on TV, you could call in, talk to a prayer partner, and they'd send you one of these from uh, Reverend Roberts' hands, and uh, it's a way of, you know, he was, he was such a um, charlatan, he was, he had no gift of healing, and he was a, a two-bit phony faker, what he was, and, um, and then he, rather than that paper napkin, he then re redid it uh, on an actual piece of cloth, only one handprint. Now, you only get one handprint, I guess. Um, but it's an it's a actual piece of cloth, a little more durable. It was the same principle. You get this as a faithful supporter, and uh, once you get your miracle, then you can send, send it back in along with the donation. And let's see here. This is this is an old uh, copy of the Book of Mormon. Eight, uh, I think the I'm going to say nineteen nineteen twenty. This one has a copyright on it, but the first uh, edition published in 1830, apparently in 1830 they didn't have it nice and fine-tuned with chapter and verse markings, and so it resembled a Bible, but in 1820 they cleaned all that up, and uh, in the beginning pages... There's the supposed testimony of the men who saw the plates and testified to the truthfulness of Joseph Smith's story. And the test, it's still printed in the front page of every book of Mor in front of every book of Mormon. One testimony called the testimony of three witnesses. And uh, so there's a paragraph here about they 
claim they'd seen the golden plates and they can testify to the veracity, the truthfulness of Joseph Smith's claim. They signed their names to it. But the last sentence reads, And the honor be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. And their names are signed. Mormons do not believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost constitute one God. And yet, in the front page of their book, the so-called witnesses of the plates uh, testify, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, which is one God. And you need to show that to any Mormon you happen to encounter the testimony of three witnesses. And in the early pages here, and I'm not going to try to search for it right now, they state that the, the Book of Mormon was from the, the plates of Nephi, the plates of uh, the Book of Ether, and the Book of another one, that these were the books translated into the Book of Mormon. It's all smoke and mirrors, all made to make you think that this book comes from ancient, ancient texts, just like the Bible did, the Hebrew man, uh, manuscripts and uh, even New Testament Greek manuscripts. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. But in the front pages, rather the front page, it, a few interesting Book of Mormon references. And uh, on that old page in the list, they list historic events that were prophesied or predicted by the Mormon, the Book of Mormon, centuries before. Here's a few of them. Columbus coming to North America. Um, and they give the so-called reference. The fate of the American Indians. The Revolutionary War. Um, and the Bible being printed and distributed. Because Joseph Smith knew that this book would be rejected by people who believe the Bible, that the Book of Mormon is just a, a cheap knockoff, a copycat. So he tried to anticipate people's criticism and uh, list all these prophecies of ancient events that the Book of Mormon had foretold. And uh, he knew that they would be trying to compare it with the Bible and say it doesn't match the Bible. Well, and you look up the references, I and mean, I'm not going to try to turn to them, but they say, a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible, we don't need anything else. And they tried to anticipate Christians and believers who would say the Bible is all we need. And uh, he'd say, well, you see, the Book of Mormon said you would talk that way. The Book of Mormon said people like you would reject our book and uh, only hang, hang on to the Bible. And so he, he thought he would preempt Christians from objecting, saying the Bible is sufficient. We don't need another book. You notice the, the Book of Mormon now, they publish the Book of Mormon, and it says another testament of Jesus Christ on the front cover. This one, they hadn't gotten that far in their heresies. It's just the Book of Mormon. Uh, in the preface notes, they say also that the um, Lamanites, they say the people of the of Mormon, people who lived here, um, broke off into two families, and their families became two tribes of people, and they had warfare with each other. Uh, and one group, the uh, Lamanites, they were wicked, and uh, they eventually wiped out all the other people, the Nephites, and so after all this warfare took place, the Lamanites were the only ones left, and they were dark-skinned. And in the preface it says, they are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. And of course, they've been confronted over that. And there's no genetic evidence, no historic evidence uh, that, that the American Indians or Native Americans are connected with Shemites or Jews who came 
from Israel centuries ago, which is what their story says. And so now modern or, or newer editions of the Book of Mormon say the American Indians are among, or rather the, the uh, Lamanites, it no longer says they are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. It now reads they are among the principal ancestors of the American. That way they leave a, an out for you can't press American Indians and uh, tradition or Jews that came from Israel over here uh, because there's no connection to them genetically. So they've re reworded the introduction. Uh, older editions of this also say that uh, when the darker skinned Lamanites would eventually, and they also link Lamanites, the darker skinned people, they also link them with black people, with dark skinned people. So, and the Book of Mormon says when they should repent, when they believe, um, they'll become a white and delightsome people. And we had a couple who used to attend church here many years ago, Bob and Ruth Doty. They had been Mormons for decades until they both got saved, started attending church here. And uh, they, had, they told me that they had been taught from their childhood up that when black people ever embrace the Book of Mormon and the, the story of Mormonism, their skin will turn white. That'll be the outward proof. That'll be the evidence that they truly believe their skin will turn white, like everyone else, like us. Of course, that never happened, and so they reworded the verses pertaining to that in modern editions of the Book of Mormon. And here is, here is what they call Holy Scriptures, supposedly translated, it wasn't translated, simply rewritten and fooled around with by Joseph Smith. This is Suppose Joseph Smith inspired version, which the Salt Lake City Church does not use. They still use the King James Bible as it is. And, uh, and they'll give you all kinds of reasons why they never adopted Joseph Smith's translation. Um, it goes through, let's see. Yeah, you got the, just about the entire Bible here, the entire 66 books. And they'll give you reasons why they never used Joseph Smith's. They still use the King James Bible. And they state in their um, statement of faith, uh, articles of faith, let me say. They call it their articles of faith. And I think it's number eight. We believe the book, uh, the Bible, is the inspired word of God, insofar as it's correctly translated. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the uh, inspired word of God. No qualifications for that. Um, so <clears throat> they're very sneaky, and there are verses in here that say people before the time of Christ, centuries before Christ were already believing on Christ and his death for their salvation. Well, you can't, you can't believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation if he hasn't died for your sake yet. His death doesn't profit or benefit you at all if he hasn't done it yet. You can't gain benefit from something that hasn't happened. And uh, you'll hear... Preachers these days, radio preachers and ministers, saying people were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, much as we're saved now looking back at the cross. That's an impossibility. Nobody was saved in the Old Testament looking forward to the death of Christ, looking forward to his death, burial, and resurrection. And you'll find all of that mentioned in the so-called before Christ section of the Book of Mormon. And uh, any preacher today 
who adopts a flimsy uh, a theology like that uh, is not much of a Bible student. He's not paying attention to rightly dividing the word of truth. Show me one case in the Old Testament where anybody was made righteous with God, they were redeemed by God, they could be regenerated by faith in something that hadn't happened yet. It doesn't happen. All right, what else I have here? Here's a, oh, this is a Masonic apron. And uh, this came to me, and I forget where I got this. But uh, I'll put it on in case anyone wants to see me with it. We have a, we have a whole briefcase at my job filled with these aprons for people at the men at the local Masonic order to come and put on an apron so they can do their Masonic funeral ritual. And uh, can everybody see this fine? To the side, to the side. To the side. To the oh. side. To, your, to your left. To my left. Yeah. To your left. Oh, the other left. Okay. All right, can everybody see my Masonic apron? This is a Jewish yarmulke. In case uh, I need that. I had, I had, uh, I was going to bring, I was going to bring, uh, um, rosary beads that are hanging on the wall in my office. I've got two sets of rosary beads, uh, one ordinary standard size, and uh, then one that's like three, four feet big. And, and I put notes on the wall underneath each set of beads, one for regular praying and one for emergency use, the, the big one. Um, I got to thinking about bringing one of those rosary beads with me and uh, how many know about the Catholic um, scapula? How many know about those? And I don't have one of those. I was, now I wish I did. I can bring it down here. But it's a, it's a, a cloth string and there's a small little piece of leather or cloth on one in, uh, tied on it or made on it, and another piece on the back side. So you wear it over your head, under your clothing. And uh, it's, it says, whosoever dies wearing this shall not suffer eternal fire. And I guess it has a picture of the Virgin Mary on the other end. And I don't know how much those things cost, 25 cents, 10 cents, but uh, it's a pretty good deal, pretty good bargain. Um, and uh, so I'll take these things off. <laughs> we see a bunch of old men, usually old men at the, from the Masonic order. Masons say they don't go out and recruit people try to get them to join. They wait for someone who is interested, who, who approaches them and shows a real uh, concern, curiosity about becoming a Mason so that they get someone who's genuinely interested. But th this is also why all Masons are old guys. There aren't any younger men who are that pitiful who have to join uh, a group like this to find some sense of belonging. Um, so the only ones that are Masons now are guys who have been Masons 
for 35, 45 years. And they're getting older now and very few young people joining. Um, and I, I realize it's tempting to say, well, the Masonic order has um, been controlling world politics for generations and generations. George Washington was a Mason, and um, most U.S. presidents had some connection to the Masonic order. And um, much of that might be true. But I've often thought, do I really want to uh, claim that the, the world and world, all of world politics, uh, all the architecture in Washington, D.C., that may be, and obviously there was some central planning to lay out the, the uh, structures and the neighborhoods and the roads in Washington, D.C. that um, I don't think Puritans uh, laid it out, and I don't think that uh, most churches were involved in laying it out. So I have to accept that secretive orders, the Masons, uh, others, were involved in laying out the patterns, the di diagrams, the, the angles of buildings and architecture. Um, but most of us, if we go to Washington, D.C., and do a little sightseeing, see the buildings and see the architecture and see the history, we don't really, I don't think that we go around that part of the country scared to death because that building might have been designed by a Masonic architect. They say George Washington, when George Washington um, was an architect uh, once upon a time also, beside being a commanding general, and he may have designed some of the the um, blueprints for the buildings in Washington. However, if you indulge these fantasies that that uh, are hard to prove, you get all kinds of information about them, but still they're hard to narrow down and nail down and say this is exactly how it happened. You're going to go crazy. Um, there's plenty to be alarmed about now, much more now than there is worrying about who designed the uh, Washington Monument and uh, who designed the Lincoln Monument and how these buildings face each other and how they point this direction, that direction. Uh, the Washington Monument is an obelisk, just like the four-sided spire uh, pyramid out in front of the Vatican. And all of those things are probably linked together through common architecture and common designs over the centuries. But you know what I'm more afraid of? I'm afraid of Joe Biden. I'm afraid of Biden and Kamala Harris uh, somehow pulling off a win on election day. I can't see how that would happen when you see all the energy behind President Trump and uh, Biden was having an appearance over in Las Vegas last week. Just the other day, he had seven people gathered. And of course, they're out. They had circles drawn on the ground for each person to stand in, to keep them socially distant and uh, speaking with a mask on and everybody else there attending with masks on. And so the energy is not with him, uh, and the energy is not even with Harris. But we know she's a socialist, and if she were to somehow win as vice president, it wouldn't be very long. He'd be gone. They'd be swearing her in as the socialist in chief. I'm more afraid of what liberal maniacs are doing to this country right now I don't want to see it continue. Um, I, I really want to see, I've already stated my preference for this year's election, but I would like to see 
the presidency of Donald Trump and a Republican blowout uh, of the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. And I want to see the Republican Party decimate the, the uh, Democrat Party. I want to see them totally obliter obliterate them so that it's going to take them 20, 25 years to regroup and they're forever a, a threat to this country again. Amen. That's exactly what needs to happen. Nothing less is going to make me happy. Uh, so brace yourself. I may be in a bad mood come <laughs> <laughs> so, Sunday after Election Day if it doesn't go that, that well. Okay, I'm sorry to waste so much time. This is James White wrote a book called The King James Only Controversy. He's a five-point Calvinist and uh, a big rejecter of the King James Bible and thinks that the, the key to understanding the Word of God is just constant, diligent study of available Greek manuscripts and materials that are available. And so he wrote this book to sort of mock, and he um, referred to Dr. Ruckman quite a bit in here because of Dr. Ruckman's stand for the King James Bible. But in the book, let me read to you a couple of excerpts. I, can, I count it a great blessing from God to have been allowed to study the Greek and Hebrew languages. I love both languages, though I admit to loving Greek a whole lot more uh, than Hebrew. And that's because Hebrew is a very difficult language. 22 consonants, no vowels, they're different, totally different alphabet, and it reads from right to left. It's very difficult to even get started in. Greek... Uh, the, most of the re um, letters resemble English letters. It reads from left to right, and most of the letters uh, have the same sound as English letters, so it's easier to jump in and get started. But Hebrew is a very uh, tedious study. Anyway, he says, uh, and I've received a tremendous amount of satisfaction from seeing, the, um, seeing men and women that I have taught in these languages, using them to the glory of God. But I also recognize that most Christians who are reading this book have not had the same opportunity, etc., 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 about uh, what a great uh, privilege he had. And then he goes just a couple pages later, page, uh, page 20, page 26. Let's read you a, a section out of here. Probably the most famous, um, well, he's, a, he's giving an example of an equivalency, translating one word uh, another way, because it means the same thing no matter which word. But he says, um, probably the most famous of these uh, is the NIV's rendering of the, of the term flesh in Paul's epistles as sinful nature. This is a bit uh, too interpretive for my tastes. Um, even in those places where sinful nature uh, would be the understanding, I would give to the term flesh. So, he decides which term is correct, which term is best. He decides which term is appropriate um, and uh, wants to mock and belittle those of us who are happy with one Bible if we could just be better students of it. And so, like I say, he really tried to single out Dr. Ruckman for being this somehow a teacher or cult leader of one Bible being perfect. So Dr. Ruckman tried to answer him by writing a book called uh, 
Yeah, the scholarship only controversy. Decided to put almost the exact identical title on it, well, the identical cover um, on his book, and single out James White for criticism and not knowing what he's talking about. And uh, I thought, well, good for Doc. He, that guy could write books faster than I could read books. I think he wrote about 150 books. And uh, he wrote books faster than I could read books. And uh, this, I'm going to finish with this today. This is an original 1950 New World translation by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they only had the New Testament starting in 1950, and I think they completed the Old Testament around 1960. But, and uh, this is a New World translation of their scriptures, uh, reference edition. This is a much bigger, thicker, thorough reference edition. And um, let you in on a little secret. Most of these things I get at thrift stores. People are eager to get rid of them, I guess. And then foolish guys like me come along and buy them for 50 cents. But they, they've stated that the name Jehovah is the, the key word to address God. That's the name God wants to be known by. And uh, in their big reference edition, they start off talking about the great indignity rendered to God by modern versions of the Bible or any version of the Bible by not translating God's divine name as Jehovah. And the four, le four Hebrew letters are called the Tetragrammaton. And uh, that's supposed to be translated as Jehovah. Four letters with no consonants in it. And some people write it uh, uh, Yeshua, um, Yahweh, but they've chosen Jehovah. Uh, and here's what it says about this section. Um, only the Hebrew text has retained this most important name in its original form of the four letters or the tetragrammaton. And then they say, the exact pronunciation of which has not been retained, has not been preserved. So the number one doctrine they say is most important. They secretly admit in the small print the exact pronunciation has not been preserved. Nobody knows how to say it. And then in their original, this was like 1983, but here, 1950, <clears throat> they said, the divine name... <clears throat> Uh, one of the uh, remarkable facts, not only about the extant manuscripts of the original Greek text, but of uh, many versions. And they talk about the four Hebrew letters. And then they state... Uh, They state that they've chosen, there are other pronunciations, but they chose Jehovah because a lot of people had heard it before. It was already familiar to people who had heard it. So they chose that pronunciation and then insist that that's the only correct pronunciation of those Hebrew letters. Um, and then the, uh, in the front pages, they list all the manuscripts they claim to have used and consulted in their translation. By the way, the list of manuscripts 
is not printed in their current editions. But they say, the Greek text that we have used as the basis of our New World Translation is the widely accepted Westcott and Hort text, 1881, by reason of its admitted excellence, but we have also taken into consideration other texts, including the, uh, that prepared by D. Eberhard Nessel and that compiled by a Spanish Jesuit scholar, Jose Maria Bouvier, and that by the other Jesuit scholar, A. Merck. I think that's Anthony Merck. So they admit that their New World translation, their New Testament, is mainly the work of manuscripts prepared by two Catholic priests or two Jesuits centuries before. And if you know anything about JWs, they're real anti-Catholic. They say just about everything corrupt was uh, begun by Catholicism. Well, I guess we see how hypocritical they are. Most down in San Diego, they have their house nicknamed Beth Serim, called the House of the Princes. In 1929, a Jehovah's Witness organization built a house in San Diego, and uh, it, was the, it was the first house built on this neighborhood. There weren't a lot of homes yet in San Diego. And uh, this was supposed, they, they put out a cover story that uh, when Christ comes back, he's going to resurrect the Old Testament saints listed in Hebrews 11. And this was going to be a home for them to live in. They're going to dwell on the earth, and they're going to reign over Christ's earthly rule here on the earth. And this house was intended for them to dwell in, to live in, when that time came. And the only person who ever lived in the house was Joseph Rutherford. He was the president of the Watchtower Society. Well, Watchtower headquarters was in Brooklyn, New York. And San Diego, California was about as far away as you could get in the U.S. Uh, without leaving the country. And the reason for that was Joseph Rutherford, their president, was an alcoholic during his declining years. And um, I mentioned not long ago, we need to revive certain pictures to put on our church website, make those things prominent, easy to find, because we need to show the hypocrisy of the JWs, show the pictures of the house. Brother Lee and I and our wives went down there and found the house about 15 years ago. And uh, it's just a private residence, just a family living there. They have a historic plaque on the front wall of the house, right by the front door. But it's just a residence, so we couldn't go in. I was hoping to go in and take some video of the place, but it was a private residence. They had small children, so I decided that we won't do that for them. And, um, you know, how many used to watch Huell Hauser when he'd visit visiting someplace here in California. And uh, my idea was to do a Huell Hauser type video there, just to walk through five to 10 minutes, maybe get somebody from the local historic society to come and fill us in on some of the, the clues uh, of the house back in 1929. And um, that maybe I can still call, talk to these people. I, still, I think I still have their phone number in my wallet. I keep changing wallets. I, get, I keep the phone number in, but anyway. 